so far, we see that the gradient values can be either too large or too small. Next, we talk about how to stabilize the training. To stabilize, to stabilize the training, we can make sure the gradient values are in the proper range. For example, we can make sure all the gradients are in a larger than 1 e minus 2 or smaller than 1 e3. That's, a range, that's just a, for example, range. Then, no matter how we change the weights, we always get the gradients on this range, and then the, the training will be less sensitive to the learning rate. There's multiple ways to do so. For example, one way is that we can change the multiplications in the gradient chain rule into a plus. Because the problem caused the trouble is that we do a lot of multiplications in computing gradients. If we change it to a plus, then this problem code could go, go, go away. To do so, we can change the network architecture. For example, we're going to talk about something called the ResNet or LSTM ladder. On the other way, we can normalize the values of the gradients. There's a layer we're going to talk about later called batch normalization, which st standardize the input of each layer. So no matter how large you have before, we standardize into mean zero and maybe unit uh, variance. On the other way, called gradient clipping, that is, we project the gradients such that the law of this gradients is lower than a particular threshold, such as 5. But today we're going to talk about two other things, one thing called weight initialization, and one is how to choose the proper activation functions to also stabilize the train. Let's start with the weight initialization. Remember that we randomly initialize the weight to start with the training. Then, if we are unlucky, then we maybe pick up a starting point is not on the proper range. For example, consider the right figure. So this is the loss function of some neural network. The blue area is the close to the optimal point, and we pick up two things here. Once near to the optimal, you can see the surface is pretty smooth. The smooth su surface means the gradient values are small and consistent. So if, if we move around nearby the op uh, optimal position, and no matter how we change the parameters, it, the gradients are almost uh, similar to each other, so which make the training less sensitive. But if, unfortunately, we pick up a position in a far away um, point, you can see that the surface change a lot, which means the tiny change of the weight or the parameter will cause the gradient ch to change significantly, so which means which make the training less stable. So before we talk about how to initialize according to normal distribution, that is, use a zero min and the variance to be 0 0.01, usually it works well for small networks. But if you're going to use a deeper and larger networks, it not guarantee this works as well, So which means we can the, the gradients can be very far away from optimal, and we have a lot of gradients bloating or um, vanishing here. Then let's consider one way how to stabilize the initialization. So one idea is that we treat both layer output and the gradients are random variables. So then for each layer, we can make sure that the mean and the variance for each layer are sent to each other, similar to gradients. So consider equations here. In the forward pass, if HTI, that is the ice element of the output of this layer, then we make sure that the expectation of HTI equals to zero, and the variance of HTI equals to A. A is constant. No matter what layers you have or which output you have, we want, we, we want to make sure that 
all the variants are equal to A. In the backward, in, to commit the gradients, we make sure that the gradients re with respect to HTI also have zero min and a constant variance. So then our goal is to, to choose with initializations, that is, we can satisfy this constraint. So let's start with, again, with a simple concrete example using multi-layer perceptron. Here we assume that using active identity uh, activation function. Also, we assume that every weight values are ID random variables, which has zero mean. And for T layer, the variance of the weight is gamma T. In particular, we assume that the input of the T layer is independent to the parameter of this layer. Both are random variables. By definition, we know that HT, the output, the output of T layer, equals to WT times HT minus 1. And HT minus 1 is an T minus 1 vector, and WT is a matrix have NT rows and NT minus 1 columns. And then HT is an NT vector. By definition, we can compute HTI equals, equals to the the J, um, the i row of WT times the input HT minus one. We can put the expectation within the sum. Then we know that both WT and HT minus one are independent to each other, and WT have zero min, and we know that then the output has also zero min. So no matter what we're going to do, by uh, this assumption, all these variants are, all this output, we have zero min. The key things on the variance. By definition of variance, we know that it's equals to the expectation of HTI um, squared minus the square of the expectation of HTI, which is zero then we only consider the first term. Again, we just uh, HTI is equal to the i's row times HT minus one. We just uh, expand these equations um, to two terms. The first term is WTIJ squared times HT minus one J squared plus and a bunch of WTIJ times WTIK, but we know that all the things are independent to each other, and expectation of WT is zero, so the second term is zero. So then we only, again, we only, we only need to consider the first term, and we can make the exp expectation within the sum. And we can see that the first term, the expectation of WTIJ squared, is actually equal to the variance of WTIJ. This is because the expectation of WTIJ is zero. S similarly, the second term, the, the expectation equals the variance. So because this, the ice row have t, um, t minus one elements, though we can write down finally, the variance of the output equals the um, t minus one times gamma t, this is the variance of the weight n times the variance of the inputs. If we want to make sure that the variance of that HTI equals the variance of HT minus 1j, then we need to guarantee nt minus 1 times gamma t equals to 1. So then this is the one, the first constraint we need to satisfy. Similar for the backward function, and we know that by chain rule, the gradient of L with respect to it, HT minus one equals to the gradients of the loss with respect to the output of the T layer times WT. And we transpose on both sides, we will get a very similar form as the forward path. So we know that 
the expectation is zero, no matter we, how we by the by the assumptions, and then because we transpose the matrix and the variance of the input of the t layer equals to t and t times gamma t times the variance of the output. And because we want to make sure that the gradients have similar variance, then we got nt times gamma t equals to 1. This is the second constraint we're going to have. Apply both strands together, we actually get a conflict that go here. Because we cannot always guarantee for layer we have similar input equals to the output size. So we cannot satisfy both nt minus 1 times gamma t equals to 1 and nt gamma t equals to 1. So to trade off it, one xvir proposed to using the gamma t times the min of the nt minus 1 plus nt equals to 1. So that is a trade off that we choose gamma t equals to 2 over nt minus 1 and nt. This is 2 over the input of this layer, the input size of this layer, and the output size of this layer. So then, this is the this is the variance of the weight initialization that we want to we can pick up different uh, random distributions such that we can normalize we can initialize the weight we can satisfy the variance of this weight. For example, if we're going to use a normal distribution, then we can choose zero mean normal distribution and the variance of the t's layer is square root of 2 over nt minus 1 plus nt. So different to the previous one, we always choose variance to be 0 0.01. Now we actually choose variance according to the input and output size of this layer. Similar thing, we can do uniform distribution that we choose um, values on the range also also related to the input and output size of this layer. So comparing to the previous one, we choose a fixed variance. Now here we can actually adapt to the weight shape. So this is this is pretty useful, especially we have very different uh, input and output size for each layers when we have a lot we have deep neural networks. So that is kind of adaptive to we can um, to the network shapes.